There we go. Okay, uh, so hi everyone. My name is Joshua Quattrochaki. Um, and today I'm gonna to give you a brief presentation on the ecological importance of veteran trees and urban landscapes and the research I did this summer in the city of Mississauga. So before I delve into my actual research, I need to give you a little bit of background information on what veteran trees are and what microhabitats are. So first, veteran trees are culturally or ecologically significant trees due to things like age, size, or characteristics. And I'm primarily gonna be focusing on characteristics. So this image on the right of the comfort maple is, is one of such of those veteran trees, where you can see it has reduced crown, dead branches, and it has hollows on it. So they're just some of the characteristics you would find on veteran trees. Veteran trees can gain this status via natural or artificial damage. So in urban landscapes, that means we can get it through uh, maintenance like pruning branches. And so young trees can be deemed veteran trees because it's not just based on age, it's also based on characteristics. So these young trees can get these characteristics and be classified as veteran trees. Veteran trees are most commonly found in urban landscapes rather than rural ones. And uh, they're often cut down prematurely due to their perceived risk. A municipality will typically look at a veteran tree and see it as a risk of falling or causing damage, and they'll likely premature, uh, prematurely fell the tree. So what are microhabitats is the other background you need to know. So these are abnormalities that are found on a tree. Um, and these are just some images of various microhabitats that you can find. So things like uh, rot holes, um, bark pockets, loss of bark, crown deadwood, fungus, et cetera. Um, these different microhabitats, there's more than just these, of course, but these different microhabitats are used by over a thousand species globally for things like habitat, resources, and mating sites. Um, and veteran trees tend to have a higher prevalence of microhabitats on them. And of course, we know that microhabitats are very important for biodiversity. So um, by default, veteran trees are also very important for biodiversity. So what's the problem? The problem is that municipalities tend to only consider risk when looking um, at veteran trees, trees and determining if, they, sorry, all trees and determining if they need to be felled or not. Um, and microhabitats are typically perceived as risks rather than assets. So this often leads to veteran trees being prematurely felled due to their perceived risk. And this felling can severely reduce urban biodiversity because we're frequently felling trees that are rich with microhabitats. The other problem is that we have no real understanding of how to manage and maintain these veteran trees. This, this isn't really reflected in our, our, um, our boar cultural practices. We don't have a proper difference between veteran trees and non-veteran trees and how we maintain them. Um, and the last issue is, of course, there's only one study to date on veteran tree formation and microhabitat formation in urban centers, and that was done by Grossman et al. in 2020 in the city of Montreal. And they essentially wanted to determine if increased levels of maintenance would increase the number of microhabitats found on trees. So I essentially recreated their study uh, in the city of Mississauga with the overall goal of trying to determine if increased maintenance would result in an increased number of microhabitats on trees. And there were three main objectives for my project. The first was to characterize the microhabitats found in the city of Mississauga. The second were to quantify those microhabitats and get the numbers of them. And the third objective is to make recommendations on current policy to help these veteran trees stay standing longer. So the methods for my project, I sampled 900 uh, trees from June to July of 2021 in the city of Mississauga. I sampled for species, GPS location, diameter at breast height, level of maintenance, and the type and number of microhabitats. The species that I sampled were restricted to honey locust, Norway maple, red maple, red oak, silver maple, and sugar maple. And the different levels of maintenance were either street trees that underwent the lowest amount of maintenance on average, Park, um, oh, sorry, park trees, which underwent the lowest amount of maintenance on average, street trees that underwent a moderate amount of maintenance on average, and uh, trees under wires or hydro lines that underwent the largest amount of maintenance on average. So the collected data was then transcribed and analyzed using Microsoft Excel, and the data analysis was used to complete goals one and two, which um, guided goal number three. So this is just a little map of the general area that I sampled in. So those three gold stars you see of Clarkson, Lauren Park, and Port Credit, those were the three general areas or neighborhoods that I sampled in, primarily because these were older neighborhoods. So we were expecting to find trees of larger DBH. That way we just wouldn't have to deal with smaller DBH sized trees. Um, I didn't sample only at these stars, of course. It was in this entire area underneath the QEW down to Lake Ontario, of course. So it was a very wide range, um, but those are just the general areas that I did sample in. So as for objective one, we wanted to characterize the types of microhabitats that were found. And these were by no means all of them, but these were the most common ones we found. So on the left, you see an image of exposed heartwood. And this is where damage, either natural or artificial, causes the, um, the heartwood layer right in the center there of the tree to be exposed to the elements. The next image on the, after that is a picture of rot. And this is where a tree suffers damage and its wounds do not heal over. 
the insides of the tree can eventually rot, which will uh, lead to hollows over time. The third image over is bark pockets, and this is where uh, damage can cause, cause barks to split or peel, and then underneath that where the damage occurs, air pockets can form between the inner layer of the tree and the outer bark layer of the tree, and that can be a really good uh, home for insects actually, because there's just a space for them to live in without having to be subjected to the elements outside. And the fourth image you see there is a picture of, a, of burrs. Uh, and these are essentially like a tumor-like formation on the outside of a tree that after it suffers damage, it tries to repair itself, but it does so improperly. So on the inside of that, like of that bird that you see there would be a bunch of knotted wood because it just didn't form properly. Um, and birds will typically come through um, most commonly insect infestation and uh, fungal infections. So as per objective two, we then wanted to quantify the microhabitats that we found. So this graph, uh, like I mentioned, these were the top, or sorry, this um, chart was the number of top five microhabitats that we found. So they were exposed heartwood, rot, exposed heartwood with rot, bark pockets, and burrs. And altogether, these five microhabitats made up about 95.5% of total observed microhabitats. So it was the bulk of it. Um, and when we look at the entire list, this kind of makes sense. So those ones that I've highlighted in green, the top six, so the ones I mentioned before, and including bark cracks as well, um, these can all be explained by both natural and artificial damage. So things like pruning could lead to any of these, these um, highlighted microhabitats. Now the non-highlighted ones, so insect holes, invertebrate nests, birds nests, sap run, epiphytes, fungus, hollows, and woodpecker cavities, those won't typically be associated with artificial damage. You wouldn't expect the cutting off a branch would lead to more insect holes forming on the trunk. Um, so we can just kind of justify that where you see that the, the different types of microhabitats that are the most common are the ones that are associated with artificial damage. So we can delve deeper into the numbers to kind of achieve our overall objective, and that is to determine if maintenance level will impact the number of microhabitats formed, and that's what you see on this graph. So on the x-axis, you have the maintenance uh, type. So there were park trees that underwent the lowest amount of maintenance, street trees that want a moderate amount of maintenance, and trees under wires that underwent the uh, largest amount of maintenance. And on the y-axis, you have the number of uh, microhabitats that were found on average. So as you can see, there's a uh, significant increase from park trees all the way up to trees under wires. So we did find that as maintenance levels increase, the number of microhabitats that we find on those trees is going to increase as well. And we can go a little more detailed on this graph. Um, so this is essentially just the same graph with including the species as well on top of the maintenance level. So on the x-axis, you have species and maintenance types or levels. And then on the y-axis, you have the number of microhabitats. So in general, the, out of the six species that I sampled, nearly all of them follow that same trend that you saw from the last graph, where there is a significant increase from park trees, which are the purple lines, to street trees, which are the blue lines, to trees under wires, which are the green lines. Um, the only two trees uh, species that were the exception to this were uh, red oak, which is the fourth set of bars right here, and sugar maple, which is the sixth set of bars right here. Uh, so with red oak, we actually noticed a, uh, in, an, an insignificant decrease from street trees to park trees in the number of microhabitats they had. And in sugar maple, we found a, an insignificant increase from street trees to, uh, sorry, not park trees, <laughs> trees under wires. Um, so with sugar maple, that, that explanation is likely because there just weren't enough sugar maples included in my study. Uh, if we were to do this again, we could, would probably want to include more, and we'd likely see that this significant trend would follow like the rest of the species. Um, so essentially overall, as with uh, the study that Grossman performed in Montreal, my study found that as maintenance increases, so do microhabitat numbers. And so knowing that, that, that these uh, veteran trees are there, I created a list of five recommendations to protect them um, and other ecologically valuable trees. So those five recommendations break down into uh, the first being research. We should be repeating this study over a longer time scale, including more samples and in other municipalities. Uh, to date, we've only done this in two. Grossman did it in Montreal. I did it in Mississauga. We can definitely do it in a lot more. Next would be to inventory these trees. Um, we can't really protect what we don't know exists. So if we don't know where they are, we don't know where to go look to protect these trees. Uh, third would be to protect them um, by creating policy that promotes the, the longer standing of these trees. So things like bylaws, um, tax incentives, or just punishment for removing them prematurely on private property. Uh, fourth would be support for these trees. So we could create proper arboricultural practices that are specifically designed for veteran trees um, because they would require a little more attention because they, they do are considered a little bit riskier and they might have things that need to be protected a little bit uh, more carefully. And the fifth would be to educate. So this would be to create education documents that we can make publicly available online that anyone can access 
ideally to help change the way we view veteran trees. Um, typically they're viewed as risky or ugly and we'd like to be able to change the general public's view on it to shift them more of, of uh, a view on that they are assets to the urban forest and to the ecosystems within them. So in conclusion, um, as with Grossman's study, we found that increased maintenance leads to an increased level of, or sorry, increased microhabitat prevalence um, in urban centers. Maintenance causes trees to gain veteran status much quicker. So that means we're seeing younger trees with veteran status because they're having the same characteristics as older ones, such as the comfort maple. Um, we know that these veteran trees primarily exist in urban forests rather than rural ones. So it's obviously important that we take action in urban forests because that's where we're gonna find them. However, municipalities tend to view these trees through a risk averse lens. So they will prematurely fell them despite the fact that they could still stand for a lot longer and provide important habitat um, and resources to the species that exist in urban centers. And so due to their ecological importance, we need to reevaluate how we view these trees. And overall, we need to create greater protection for veteran trees to ideally help them stay standing longer. Um, so while well, you get to enjoy this picture of me with the final tree in my study, I'm just going to take time to acknowledge my supervisor, Sandy Smith and Philip Van Wassner for their help and support through this project. I'd like to thank my tax and the partial funding of this project. I'd also like to thank the city of Mississauga for providing the tree inventory data. And I'd like to thank my classmates for your friendship over the last year and a half and my fiance, Haley Ryan, for her continued support throughout my education. Thank you. Uh, Philip is online, and uh, Philip, would you like to take the first opportunity for questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Josh. That was an um, excellent presentation. Um, I guess one of the questions I was going to ask of you is whether if you felt like you had a um, wider geographic sort of uh, reach in, in, in the study across Mississauga, whether um, the results would be the same throughout the city or whether um, the areas you chose would be the, the most likely ones to, to uh, bring forward these results. Right, absolutely, good question. Um, I, I would expect that even if we were to extend the range, we'd likely find the same thing. Um, but to your point, uh, the, the range was a little bit of a drawback from my study. So we, we selected those three areas because we were expecting to find large trees there. They weren't selected for any other real reason other than that. Um, and so sampling was uh, a little bit restricted because I wasn't sampling the entirety of Mississauga. I was only sampling a portion of it. Um, but just based on Grossman's study, I, I don't see any biological reason why like increasing the size wouldn't uh, yield the same results. I think it would actually help us see the trends a little more clearly that, that I found and Grossman found in his study. Thank you. I guess I, guess I uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, I, I guess I can ask my question about red oak and what's going on with red oak. Uh, I, and I can't remember, did uh, Montreal, did they survey red oak or are we unique on that? Uh, they, they surveyed red oak as well. Um, and they found that it was significantly increasing with the rest of them. So um, while I tried to find out what the reason was for this, I couldn't, again, find any biological reason why red oak would decrease with um, you know increased maintenance. The only reason why I'm going to skip a few slides because I have yeah, a bunch of back. stuff. Maybe. Um, yeah. So if you look at these, this this uh, graph is just the DBH of uh, the different species, and you can actually see over here of um, red oak is drastically larger by almost 10 centimeters on straight trees to trees under wires. Um, uh, so I would just venture a guess that the the DBH, because I didn't really control for it, it was a continuous um, variable in my study, that likely would explain why there was a decrease because the street trees of red oaks had higher DBHs than the street, uh, the part, sorry, trees under wires of red oaks. <laughs> so, and maybe a follow-up. So why would those trees under wires for red oak be smaller DBH? Uh, well, so this is because DBH is also another factor that uh, impacts the number of microhabitats that form um, because we typically, uh, as trees get older, they're going to get larger and we're finding a larger number of microhabitats on them. So um, we can't just say that like the maintenance type is the only factor affecting uh, uh, microhabitat formation. So because the DBH of these trees are larger, we would expect it to have a larger number of microhabitats. So do you think the trees under the wire, the oak trees under wires are just younger? I would Maybe, think they I mean, if you're going to equate DBH to age, 
Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would, I would think that they would be younger. Um, unfortunately I didn't do an age study, uh, but that would be great to know. But I would, I would again guess that if I, we went out and controlled for DBH and did more sampling with red oaks, we would likely see the same trends because it's what's almost likely happening is that the tree, the red oak trees underneath hydro lines are probably just younger and therefore having lower numbers of uh, microhabitats on them. Yeah, I think it would be really interesting. I mean, it's always hard to, to, focus on age but I mean I think it would be really interesting to go back and sort of look at these how many how many oaks were in that sample do you remember like like Corcus what's uh I probably should have included that and yeah, I don't yeah. think I have the numbers on my slides most likely not yeah. <laughs> no that's all microhabitat numbers so I don't but I could that will be in my report so <laughs> we can look no, at it I was it. just curious because uh yeah they obviously have uh yeah they're, they're the biggest trees that you have if mm -hmm. that's significant so yes. Cool. I'm going to go Josh, back to uh, Philip there. Go ahead, oh, Philip. Thank you. Uh, Josh, just one, one more question. Um, you mentioned a couple of times that um, uh, veteran trees are more prevalent in the urban environment than in the rural. Can you um, just give a little more clarification on why you felt that? Uh, yeah, so there's, um, in the literature review that I did, we, um, there was a study done in Rome, I believe by Carpinetto et al in, I think, 2014. Um, and they had, they had done a sampling there in Rome to see uh, the number of veteran trees in the urban centers of Rome versus the, the rural countryside of Rome. And so they, they concluded that, like, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was drastically larger that you're going to find um, these veteran trees in urban landscapes as opposed to in the rural communities. And this makes sense because when we're looking at veteran trees in the context of they have a large number of microhabitats, trees in urban centers are gonna be a lot more heavily maintained than ones in rural communities. Um, and so we're gonna be expecting them to have these microhabitats more often forming than, uh, than in the countryside trees. Um, I, I guess I might, I might just caution you a little bit with that um, because you know Rome, and Italy is a little bit different environment than we find ourselves here in North America, where we do have a lot of sort of a quote unquote wilderness around us. And my experience would be that in forests, we have a lot of microhabitat. It may not be created by wounding from, from humans, but there's a lot of microhabitat there. And I think that just, I think it's something to be thoughtful of um, in terms of where your research uh, location is, because Europe is, um, has a paucity of the type of um, natural forest that we do where where habitat is still prevalent. So just a, just a note of caution. Right, absolutely. Uh, Fred, I noticed that you had your hand raised a moment ago. Sure, Th thanks, Josh. I missed the first part of your presentation. Uh, so my question is, in terms of what criteria are you using to define these trees as veteran trees? And the reason why I'm asking this, Josh, is because I came up with the concept of 26 years ago and at that time, um, and it was adopted by Ontario 26 years ago, then after that by the US Forest Service and uh, provinces from Manitoba eastwards. Um, and it was based upon the understanding that certain trees survived natural disturbances. And we need to incorporate that into forestry practices uh, and recognize them. I there's a whole bunch of ecological values to them. Um, and I, I didn't want to go into a lot of detail in that, but you know, some things we knew, some things we didn't know that have now become known to us over the past 20, 26 years. Uh, so, so I'm glad you're able to kind of extend this into the urban forest. And I, I, I agree with uh, what Philip was saying about uh, other areas in the rural, rural areas of Southern Ontario. So it's going to come from the questions, um, like, is it based upon actual uh, data that we have here? Because the idea of veteran trees did not exist in the Western literature 26 years ago. But when I started looking at the data that was in the papers that were published, the data showed that certain trees survived. But the authors never recognize that in the, in the discussion or the conclusions or the analysis. Um, so, you know, you've got to be careful with this taking things out of context. Uh, and um, I, I think, you know, what you've done is great in that it could help um, identify the value of veteran trees in Southern Ontario woodlots, for example, and increase the, uh, um, the uh, awareness, I guess, of landowners there too. So I, I just want to kind of Briefly, tell us what, what, it, what you'd used again for your criteria for veteran trees in the urban forest. Uh, right. So, so really what the definition that I took for veteran trees, it, admittedly, it's, it's a little bit um, hard to pin down. Like you mentioned, we don't really have that descriptor in the 
um, in North America. It's it, in Europe, veteran trees and their protection is a lot um, better. But in North America, it's not really a thing we incorporate into um, our urban forest protection. So what I did was the definition of a veteran tree really came from the various um, definitions I could find in literature, which admittedly wasn't much. Um, but then I also reflected or relied on the use of the um, ancient tree definitions as well, because ancient trees, which is what they call veteran trees over in Europe, um, they're a little bit better defined because they have that, that protection in their urban forests. Um, so it really like the, the best definition I, I could come up with to define these trees that I found, um, which is why I included a picture of the comfort maple, is you're going to find these trees with increased levels of, of like um, microhabitats on them or things like reduced crowns, hollow trunks, wider trunks, anything that, that a, would provide very great um, ecological benefit in terms of like habitat, uh, resources, mating sites, etc. Like that, that is what fell into the definition of a veteran tree for me. Um, but I absolutely agree. I think it's, I've only really scratched the surface of what um, veteran trees are in North America. And my studies really only scratch the surface of this stuff. Um, and we need to do more research and, and I think more properly define what veteran trees are in North America before we continue doing this research. Good, thanks. Josh, great, great presentation. Uh, I just had a question. You mentioned it briefly about the arboricultural practices for veteran trees. Do you have any examples of arboricultural practices that would um, apply to just veteran trees? Um, yeah, so when I say like arboricultural practices and like between veteran and non-veteran, essentially there's no real difference. So when you go um, analyze a tree that's, let's say on the street, you need to make sure it's X amount of meters above the, the roadway, it's X amount of meters away from driveways, the sidewalk, et cetera, to make sure it's not an obstruction to view or causing damage for things like that. Um, so when you go out to a tree to assess it and you're like, oh, that branch is a little bit too close to the road, we're just going to cut it off. Um, there wouldn't really be a difference between like a veteran tree and a non-veteran tree. So when you're looking at these veteran trees, um, municipality is going to see them a little bit riskier because they might see, oh, that limb is leaning a little too far. We should just cut the entire limb off where we could, we could do things like, oh, let's, let's put a cable and tie that limb to the rest of the tree. Or let's make ways to make sure this tree can stay standing longer rather than hacking off all its body parts until it eventually has to be cut down completely. Absolutely. Yeah. Good answer. Jay, do you, does your question still need answering? No, I'm good. It was the same uh, question as Ben. Okay, uh, great. I, I have a, a quick question for you, Josh. So this is, you're, you're looking at these microhabitats on urban trees. Like what's the expectation? What do, what does the natural distribution of wounds and microhabitats look like in a non-urban environment? Yeah, uh, great question. And um, that's something that we ended up cutting out of the study for lack of time. Um, so in Grossman's study, they included a natural a group of trees, which was, they include forest trees as well. So we, they expect there to be no maintenance on those trees whatsoever. Um, and they had found that they had the, I think, lowest number of uh, microhabitats on average when you compare DBHs between all the different maintenance types. Um, we had cut it out of our study because there was a lack of time and there was also a lack of, I think, appropriate forests in, in Mississauga because they had very different species than what I was sampling on the streets. Um, so we would have ended up comparing like just completely different species in forests to what I found on, on uh, urban centers. And I think it just would have been more difficult to draw proper conclusions. But ideally, we did find that, yes, uh, for natural trees had lower number of microhabitats on average. So, and that's it's interesting then, because is there a possibility, is there the risk of having too many micro habitats? I mean, it's difficult to say that more habitat would be bad, but if relative to natural, I'm making air quotes for those online, uh, natural conditions, you know, do we want to maximize the number of micro habitats or match what we would see in the evolutionary history of these systems? Right, yeah, great question. And I think the next step there would be essentially to do a study to see what's actually using these microhabitats. So I know that, we know that they're there, that's what my study did and that's what Grossman's study did, but we can only say to a certain degree what's actually using them until we go out there and look. So if we went out and actually sampled the usage of microhabitats by the various species, how many are actually occupied, we would be able to get better numbers on if they're actually being utilized and then determine if perhaps we do have too many microhabitats in our urban centers. That's great, thank you. Uh, and actually the timing is perfect because that is, it is time for us to move on to our final speaker. So thank you very much, Josh.